Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm going to be going over Kant and Hegel. Specifically, I'm going to be detailing the inversion that Hegel did to Kant's thing in itself, or Das an sich. Um, so we're going to start with Kant, we're going to go to Hegel, and then kind of talk about the implications. And then I think I'm going to go a little bit into Zizek as well, and sort of what he took from this, and what he added onto Hegel. Um, so, Kant's thing in itself... Kant's idea of cognization of objects in the world is that objects in the world are not really the essence of themselves. They are not the thing itself. So through this whole transcendental deduction, which is not something we're going to get into here, we will just say that eventually, in our minds, we reach this point where objects are cognized, but the object which is cognized is not that which is in the world. It, the essence of the object which is cognized is not that which is in the world. The object that is cognized is like this indeterminate thing which we have no access to. Now, what does like what does this mean for our purposes? Well, what this means is that we can never have like complete knowledge of things in the world, of phenomena, as Kant would say, because the nominic or the nominal um, distinction is present. So we're just quick going over Kant. I have other videos on this where I talk about space and time and how that's related to this as well. Um, I talk about the nomina phenomena distinction in my uh, video on Kant's theory of self. But we're going to go to Hegel now. So Hegel's like, okay, we can totally have knowledge of the thing in itself. The thing in itself is merely just the, the, um, the uh, universal abstraction, the, the universal negative abstractions from an object. That's complicated, so we'll go over what a universal negative abstraction is. So, take a apple, okay? Uh, if you negate the redness, and you negate the, like, the, uh, the, the sphereness, and you negate the, um, whatever else you think an apple is, negate that, and you're left with the emptiness of a thing, or an emptiness of a form which itself is a thing, right? Um, Hegel would say that the, the negation would affirm, would affirm a determination. So through these abstract negations, you yourself are affirming the empty form itself of the apple. And Hegel's like, that's the thing in itself. It's the empty form itself abstracted away from everything which makes it what it appears to be itself. For another example, we can do this like, we'll do... Um, a tree, right? So you abstract, you abstract away everything you think a tree is. It's so brown, there's like leaves, it's green on the top, um, there's like roots, right? The, the, the surface of the tree just abstracted all the way. And you're left with just this like emptiness of a form. And that is what Hegel says the thing in itself is. So contra Kant, where Kant's like, there's no knowledge of the thing in itself, it can merely be thought, but there's no knowledge of it. Hegel's like, no, there's clearly knowledge of the thing in itself, right? We just we just did knowledge. We just we just gave it a determinate form through its supposed indeterminacy. And this would be what he would call like a dialectical inversion, right? This supposedly indeterminate nature of the thing in itself affirms itself to be determinate because the indeterminacy is just the like removal and or just the abstract negation of things which make the object in the world what it seemingly is. Okay, so if, if that, if you're good on that, um, rewatch that, turn your subtitles on, because you know, it's confusing explaining Hegel over a uh, voice. But the next part that Hegel goes is he's like, ah, all right, Kant is correct. The world is a world of appearance, but he's not correct in the way he thinks he is. There's a, uh, not chapter, but like a subsection in Hegel's Science of Logic called Appearance and the World of Appearance, right? Because Kant's, one of Kant's main uh, sayings was, we would live in a world of appearances, because, again, we um, can't have knowledge of the thing itself. So Hegel's like, yeah, no, actually, Kant, you're totally right. We live in a world of appearances, but you're just completely dead wrong on what that means. So Hegel's point is that things have their essence or have their grounding in not the thing itself, but in the other. So in the not thing. So 
one of the best demonstrations I think he, I think that he gives of this is through um, Democritus's um, philosophy of autonomism. Uh, Democritus is Democritus, whatever you say his name. He's the pre-Socratic um, whose name democracy comes from his name. He was big on voting, and he also is, uh, had a philosophy known as atomism. So atomism is basically like all the things in the world are made up of these tiny little like balls that he calls atoms, these little gray balls, right? Um, and so Hegel, and so in De De Democritus' system, he opposed the atom, the little gray ball, from the void or from the not atom, from like the thing that separated it, right? So he's like, these are opposites. Like there's there's nothing in common. This is literally like the void is the nothingness which separates atoms. And the atom is, you know, the atom. So Hegel's whole point is that the void itself is what instantiates the position of atom, right? Because the limit of the atom is only insofar as the void is. If you do not have a void, there is no limit of the atom, and thus the atom is not multiple atoms, it's just a single atom, right? It would be an atom at infinitum, like an atom which stretches towards infinity. So Hegel's point is, like, to think of a system where there's, like, little, like, gray balls which would make up all things in the world would require you to um, recognize that the position the essence, the grounding of those little gray balls is not in the little gray balls, but is itself in the void, in the supposedly nothingness which separates them. So again, taking this into our world, everything in the world does not have its grounding in itself. It has its grounding in the not-self, in, in what it is not. This is why um, Hegel says that everything is an other of the other. Because this is, this is, he calls this um, reflection, right? There's various names he has for this, but we'll just shorten it and we'll just say reflection. So when you, when, when a thing is, a thing exists, for it to, you know, have concrete existence in the world, or whatever, an apple, chair, table, whatever, it must have relation to an other, to what it is not to its supposed opposite. But this, but there's a movement at the supposed opposite to have relation to, that the supposed opposite must also have relation to an other, which then doubles this, this what we can call the subject, as an other, right? Which is why, again, there is an other of the other. The other being the supposed other, the required presupp presupposed other, and then that presupposed other, when to have concrete existence, must simultaneously affirm and other itself. Okay. So, another way we can think of this is um, through... Um, yeah, yeah. I don't, we'll, we'll go there. We'll go there. So, the way we can think of this is like, take an apple and think, like, you, you hold an apple in the air. And think like the air around the apple, and then think like your hand, and then think like these are limits to the thing, right? So again, we'll go back to Democritus, where like the not void instantiated the limit, which promulgated and instantiated simultaneously the atom. So in this example of the apple, the apple, the limit of the apple, right, the spherical shape and where that ends and opens up to the air, or, right, the not apple, this, this, uh, this, this is the limit which is required for the apple to have existence, but for a limit, there must be something beyond the limit. This is another thing which Hegel corrected of Kant, where Kant just had, like, the limit, and this is, again, why the nomina is determinate, because the limit must have a determination beyond it for it to be a limit, because a limit is never just, like, a one-way thing, right? If you put a limit, uh, we'll do an easy example. You put a limit down in the street, right, separating the street, right? You're like, this is my street, and the other guy's like, this is my street. You have a limit, but that limit has things on both sides, my street and the other guy's street. Similar in all cases of objects in the world, a limit, the object is limited, it has a limit in its nature. 
And this limit is itself what creates the object. But the limit also has a relation to the not object. Remember, like I gave the example of the, the void, or the nothingness of Democritus' system, or the apple example, we can say the air would be the would be the beyond limit. So again, all these objects have limits. But for this object to be, for this thing beyond the limit to be, there must be a reflection in itself of the object. This is the point where the object, quote unquote, reflects through the other, and then this instantiates the object. Same thing with the other. The other reflects through the object, and this instantiates the other through the object. Um, so it's a simultaneous, simultaneous position, which affirms both at the same time. Um, so that's, that's kind of the thrust of Hegel's system of metaphysics. Um, so we're going to move into Zizek now. So while Hegel would, would consider everything to be an appearance of the world, the finite things in the world, the one thing which is, you know, like has its mediation in itself, through itself, with itself, is God, the Trinity. Uh, Hegel is a Lutheran. So the Trinity God is that which mediates itself and itself through itself. That means that the differences, the, um, the, the, the three persons of the Trinity, you can say in Anselm's terms, would be, um, you, have, you know, you have Christ, you have the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the mediation for Hegel is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is both a thing and the mediation itself of the Trinity. And the Trinity mediates its differences, being the three persons, in the one, being the Trinity as a whole, mediates it, right? So you take the Trinity as a whole, and this is the, you can say, the sublation or the Aufhebung in German of, of these differences, which then affirm themselves and go beyond themselves to be the one image of the Trinity. This is why you can say the Trinity has four moments. You have God, the Father, Holy Spirit, and then you have the Trinity itself. Um, so what Zizek says, so again, this is like what Hegel's, Hegel is Lutheran. Zizek is not. Uh, you can watch my video on Zizek's Christian atheism. And Zizek's point is that, no, actually, everything in the world is an appearance, and it's an appearance appearing to itself. So the appearances have an external relation only with the totality of appearances in the world. And this is what gives it the reflection. Hegel also basically says this, where there's a relation to the world, which instantiates a reflection. Um, you can see like a correspondence to the world um, allows, the, allows the thing to, you know, have some grounding, you can say. You can even just, if you want to be super simple, you can just say that th what the other is in Hegel's metaphysics is just the external world. It's just the relation to the external world. Unless you give specific examples, this would probably be pretty true. Um, so yeah, with Zizek, you have appearance appearing to itself. There is no, for Zizek, there is no God, so there is no appearance appearing to something which can mediate itself through itself with itself. There is just the appearance appearing to itself. Zizek says this is the self-relating negativity. As there is a nothing, as there is a sense of nothingness, through which the world of appearances revolves itself around, even though it instantiates itself through the other, there is not this, like, shining forth of God, as Hegel would see. Um, so, this is how Zizek would conceive of his dialectical materialism from Marx uh, through a more Hegelian twist, right? Um, but, under law, but throughout all this self-relating negativity, there has to be a something, one sort of positive thing which instantiates the the subject or rather at the instantiation of this public of this positive thing is itself the lack of the subject so this would kind of be hegel's point now we can go back to what i said i've actually never thought about this before but through making this video this makes me think of this is that when when Zizek says that like this this end this this loss the object da uh, for lacan is is the only positive thing this in this creation of a loss, this supposed indeterminacy itself reveals itself or shows itself or instantiates itself to be determinate, to be a determinate object. But that object is itself the lack of an object. So again, this, this relates precisely to Hegel's inversion of Kant's thing in itself. Kant's thing in itself, the indeterminate object, reveals itself to be like the form of lack of an object this sort of nothingness formed object, 
but the object is itself just like a form of like like nothingness if we can if you can think nothingness i don't mean like complete nothingness as hegel thought but like nothingness in the colloquial sense um but yeah that's gonna have to probably be it that's gonna be the end of the video um so i went through we did kant uh again go to my kant videos if you want to learn more about him i was trying to get to hegel and zizek so i sped through him go to kant videos if you want to learn more about kant my first video on hegel um so gonna be making more videos on that probably go to my video on zizek um if you want to learn more about zizek's christian atheism because i do mention i think i mention appearances appearing but it's i went more in depth here um so yeah go ahead and subscribe down below like the video and i'll make more videos on hegel stay tuned have a nice day